Welcome to a Trek Zone conversation. Matt Miller with you at Trek Zone HQ. Porgus continues its day 17 of our campaign to raise money for Guide Dogs Australia. Can you help us help them? We need you to beam over to bit.ly slash TZ Guide Dogs and donate now. Well, my guest on this edition is Andrew Jarvis. Now, you might not recognise the name, but you'll certainly know his and his team's work. It was all over Star Trek Picard. Beaming around the world across Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts and YouTube, this is the eighth season of A Trek Zone Conversation with Matt Miller. Andrew, welcome and thanks for having A Trek Zone Conversation. Thanks for having me. Now, for those playing along at home, can you tell us how you got to know the Star Trek universe so intimately? I've been a lifelong fan of Star Trek. Uh, even before TNG came out, I was watching uh, old reruns of TOS. I have my uncle Mike to thank for that. Uh, it wasn't very popular in school, so it was a great universe to escape to. Uh, I had all the technical manuals. I had the TOS uh, Starfleet technical manual, uh, Mr. Scott's Guide to the Enterprise, and then, of course, the Holy Grail. The Star Trek Next Generation technical manual. That is very cool. Well, your Star Trek journey has almost come full circle now after you worked on the first season of Picard. What exactly did you do? So Twisted Media, the company I worked for, was commissioned to develop all of the UI that you see in Star Trek Picard. So that includes everything in pre-production, through production, everything that was captured in camera, and the 3D holographic interfaces, of which there are many. Well, we were talking off air in the lead up to today's show that while TNG, DS9 and Voyager had a lot of backlit panels, some video playback on set and a whole bunch of actors pointing and tapping on consoles, Picard has embraced the advancements in real world technology uh, and gives the characters the chance to be surrounded by the user interface. Does that create some challenges for you and, and the gang at Twisted Media having to put all this together? Well, absolutely, but they're creative challenges, which we love. Uh, those backlit panels you're talking about are called translites, and I was so pumped that we were able to use those in the Serena uh, because it gives you that really sexy, shiny, like TNG bridge feel. Uh, I think the Next Generation bridge is the most beautifully designed bridge in all of science fiction. One of my early pitches for how to represent Alcars in 3D was to, to literally just have sort of pieces of black glass hovering in midair with Alcars on them, and that, that would be the holographic interface. Um, we didn't see a ton of Alcars. Uh, I'm hoping we see more in season two, although there were some beautiful shots. Uh, but for something like the Serena or the Romulan UI, you really had this, this very well integrated process from pre-production all the way through the shooting uh, and into post-production where myself and the rest of the team at Twisted Media were designing things so that the UI that you see looks believably part of the same world as the 3D holographic interface that's above it. Some behind the scenes images on Facebook show almost fully CG created bridges for Riker and Admiral O's ships in that final episode. Did you guys have a hand in their creations? Right, well, the Zenhi was filmed on the sort of a modified version of the Discovery Bridge. Um, and it did use graphics I had designed or graphical elements, but I didn't even know about it until after I'd done it. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, if we look at the way that the series is composed, uh, the series as a whole, uh, there's a lot more integration with the CG elements, uh, isn't there? They're almost doing a CGI pass over the whole episode, certainly compared to 90s track. Oh, absolutely. I mean, the Serena, you know, most of the time people are, are unless they're using the translite panels, they're, they're just waving their hands in the air. And... You know, thank God the, the actors did a great job. And really, the whole time, failure is not an option. You've got what the script says they have to do, and you've got what was captured in camera. Now make a graphic. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, as, as an editor myself, I've always wondered about large-scale productions. How do you, as a graphic artist, integrate the actors' hand movements and what they're doing into preset, pre-made graphics? Okay. All right. Well, a great example of this is uh, when Laris uh, Ola Brady is uh, looking up Dodge's phone records. She does some really kind of, she gave me a lot to work with and I love it, but she did some really weird hand motions. If you go back and look at the episode, she just kind of goes like this. And I, I had to look at that and go, all right, well, what does that look like? And to me, it kind of looked like making sort of a broad selection of things. So I designed a bunch of little elements and I just made them all light up as her finger went around them. So 
you know, again, f failure is not an option. It, it's just that one of those things where uh, whatever, whatever needs to happen at that moment in the show and whatever they did that was captured in camera, now now make a graphic that fulfills both of those. Well, it sounds like not everything is locked into place with rigid storyboards. So you've got a bit of creativity to make the actions fit with the graphics? Yeah, and, and it works the other way too. So for example, uh, when Michelle Hurd uh, had the uh, 3D representation of Vashti and she pushes that up onto the, the view screen, I, I have a distinct memory of preparing a, a an example 3D uh, 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 graphic that our playback supervisor, Martin Garner, showed to her before she did it. So the, the, you can kind of give the actors an idea of what they're going to be working with ahead of time. The best example of this is the flight control glove that Rios uses. Uh, this was Chris Kiefer's idea. Uh, he wanted something really physical to pilot the ship with. Uh, and so I started uh, designing concepts around this, but we were on the clock because we were about to film that scene. You, you know the scene I'm talking about, like, where, where Picard says engage, Rio says to move his hands somehow. And I had done this video of like what the different hand motions should be for throttle, pitch, roll, yaw. But there was some question as to whether or not they'd even be able to show it to him before they filmed it. Uh, but thank God they did. Well, for you and the Twister Media team, where do the creative juices come from in expanding the Star Trek universe? Sure. Well, during the look development process, we're just thinking about what personality these graphics project. So with Alcars, you have these beautiful lines and curves, and on the far opposite end of the spectrum, you've got Borg, which should feel just oppressively dense, uh, and everything in between. You know, I was constantly looking uh, at the source material. I was pouring through TNG, Voyager, Deep Space Nine, all the Berman era material uh, that Michael Okuda worked on and his team to develop um, really making sure that, that that we stayed true to that and that it felt like a natural progression from that era 20 years later to, to be this. The Serena, obviously there was no precedent set, so that was just all fun and games. You know, we were able to, to just think, all right, what is, uh, what is a really high tech uh, ship in the 25th century look like? Uh, whereas with something like Romulan, there was something established and I wanted to make sure I was really respectful of that. I noticed that Michael Okuda and his team uh, used a lot of upside down triangles in their designs. Uh, so if you look at all of uh, my Romulan holograms had that sort of same sort of uh, overall uh, composition. Uh, Rafi's UI, uh, which I'm guessing that about like maybe 50% to as high as 90% of the people listening to this, uh, when I talk about Rafi's UI, you're probably thinking of the Serena because she's always sitting in front of those orange graphics. Uh, those orange ones are obviously the Serena graphics, uh, but I wanted to make sure that whenever Rafi was seen using her own tech, that had its own look and feel and sort of projected her personality. And of course, the legendary Mike Akuda, modernizing, refreshing, and bringing forward his epic designs. 25th century all cars, yes. Um, so all through 2019, there were kind of whispers that we might be getting it, uh, that we might be able to, to, to work on Picard, uh, but it wasn't a sure thing yet. There was no indication of what species we would actually see, uh, but I figured, you know, there was one thing that we would definitely need uh, would be an update all cars. Uh, so this was around uh, mid-December, and this is before anyone else started working on it. I just said, you know what, like, even if it's not a sure thing, uh, if there's a chance, I'm, I'm gonna start on it. So barricade myself in my office, uh, for about a month. Uh, so from mid-December to mid-January, giving myself a bit of a, a, a minimalist cleanse for this uh, because I knew that the kind of projects I've been working on prior had really had a huge emphasis on density and movement and, and just more is more. And I wanted this to be more than just a funky remix of Alcars. I wanted it to be a real refinement of the beautiful work that Michael Okuda had done and something that had meant so much to me over the years. What came out of that period uh, from mid-December to mid-January uh, was, I, I hope, uh, very similar to traditional L cars. Um, I had added a trim line, um, I had reduced some of the buttons. Uh, I get some flack for that uh, on the, from the Trek community. Uh, they say, oh, how could you use it? There aren't enough buttons. Uh, well, 
in my defense, we don't really see people using Alucard as much in Picard. Hopefully we'll, we'll see more in season two. Uh, but, but, I, but I definitely had in mind that, that things would sort of fly out as you interact with it. Um, but I wanted to keep what really makes Alucard's beautiful, those clean lines and those clean curves. Uh, I chose in Tungsten as a typeface. Uh, Michael Okuda is, I believe, is Swiss 911, condensed. You know, going through an entire production, you need uh, a typeface that has all those different weights so that, you know, when you get a note like, make it just a little bolder, you can do that. <laughs> uh, and everything obviously right aligned. Uh, I just think that looks great. Well, you know, this is something I'm loving finding out about New Trek. Everyone involved is a fan of Star Trek. They love what has been all those 726 episodes, the 10 movies, expanding that, bringing it forward, putting their own spin uh, on the franchise, on the universe, because that's part of being in the creative business. Uh, but there's always that desire to pay homage to what has been Rick Berman's Trek, Gene Roddenberry's Trek. Uh, and all this goes to being a little bit more than a job, maybe uh, a little bit more like a passion project. Yeah, I mean, it, I feel incredibly lucky. I mean, how many people get to say it's something that meant so much to them in their childhood uh, would be a part of their adult life? Um, I'm eternally grateful uh, to Derek Fredrickson for putting me on the project, everyone at Twisted Media, um, Chris Kiefer, uh, he's an industry veteran and the reason we have the show. Uh, but he wasn't a Star Trek fan, and he knew that I was, so he kind of let me take the lead on that, which I really appreciate. Um, I'm, I'm just eternally grateful for how the whole thing went down. Well, with coronavirus ravaging the world at the moment and everyone taking five, some working from home, others unfortunately laid off for now, are there any plans for Twisted Media to join Picard in season two? <laughs> nice try. Yeah. No, I, I, I can't speak to that. Um, I will say this. I, I haven't seen a script. I really hope there are Klingons in it. I, 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 I just think that like the Klingon UI has always looked cool. Ever since like 1979, the motion picture, uh, just that like honeycomb of, of red triangles and just, oh, I'd love to get my hands on it. <laughs> so the key takeaway, of course, is to watch this space. Andrew, if folks want to reach out and say g'day, uh, how can they go about doing that? Well, thank you for asking. Um, on Twitter, I'm a Jarvis underscore art. On Instagram, I am andrewjarvis.art, which is also the name of my website. And if you check that out, andrewjarvis.art, there is a 4K version of that map in Clancy's office. You know what I'm talking about. Oh, Andrew, you tease. Well, Trek Zone's all over social media. Just search for Trek Zone on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Tumblr. Plus on YouTube, get subscribed and ring the bell to never miss a moment. We're now beaming out Mondays, Talking Science Wednesdays, and live every Friday. Plus a new series, Trek Zone Plays, where I'm going to dive into the fantastic world of retro Trek games on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Andrew, it's been a blast to get a taste for working on Picard with these graphics you've shared and that map, very, very cool. Well, let's hope season two is yours for the taking, but coronavirus just has to go away first. Yeah, it would be nice if the world would unpause. No no sooner than it should, though. Of course, absolutely, Andrew. Well, thanks very much for having a Trek Zone conversation today, and uh, good luck with the future. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for having me on. 